Again, good evening. We're settling in. Let's grab our Bibles and let's open to Exodus chapter 30. The plan tonight is to actually finish up the final instructions God gave to Moses concerning the tabernacle. As you remember, the Lord called him up there on, on that mountain and began, as we've seen over the last several chapters, um, unpack to Moses instructions concerning not only the, the tabernacle proper itself, but all the furnishings, all of the offerings, all of the requirements for the priest. This way, this provision that God made for him to be able to dwell among his people. This way, as we've talked about over and over, ultimately pointing to God's final dwelling place, God's ultimate tabernacling among humanity, that, of course, being the person Jesus. And as tedious as these chapters are and have been, I don't know about you, but for me, one of the blessings of going through this is that it makes us really appreciate the work of Jesus on our behalf in greater ways. If we, don't get, if we don't get lost in all the details, we really come out of this with a deeper understanding of the work of our Savior and just a richer recognition of all that we've been brought into. And that's exactly what we have more of now as we finish up God's instructions to Moses. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord um, to open our eyes that we might see Jesus once again in these things. And so, Father, we do. We thank you, God, for all of your word, Lord. And um, Lord, your tabernacle was extremely important to the children of Israel, Lord. You set apart a, a huge chunk of your word, Lord, to record this. And Father, we thank you for it, Lord, because even though we're under a new covenant, Lord, because of the old covenant, we're able to see the glory and the beauty of what we now have been brought into. And so as you've been so faithful to do, I just pray once more, as we wrap up these instructions, that you would let us see Jesus, that you would let us see the picture, the type, that all of this was pointing to in him. And he would be glorified before us tonight, just as we've already seen. And so we ask this and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1, Exodus chapter 30. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides, all around, and horns with pure gold. And you shall make it for a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding on both of its sides. You shall place them on its two sides, and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. And so again, after a couple of chapters, we've seen God dealing with the priest and their garments and the whole consecration ceremony for preparing them. God now returns back to his, construct, his instructions that he left off with concerning the furnishings of the tabernacle. And the next piece of furniture that he comes to and gives instruction to Moses about is the altar of incense. Now, remember, we've already talked about one altar. That is the altar of burnt offering. But this altar is now different, and I want to throw back up on the screen the slide that we've used before just to kind of keep this picture in our mind of, of the layout of the, of the tabernacle proper, the courtyard, and then the tabernacle itself. Now, the altar of burnt offering, you remember, was overlaid with bronze. But the altar of incense that God now calls Moses to make next was to be overlaid with gold. And whereas, as, as you notice on the screen, the altar of burnt offering was the first piece of furniture— that was encountered when you came into the courtyard of the tabernacle, the altar of incense was the very last piece of furniture that the priest would encounter before the high priest could enter in to the Holy of Holies. As it sat just outside that inner veil, before the Ark of the Covenant, or as it's described here, the Ark of the Testimony. Remember, it's called the Ark of the Testimony because within the Ark was a copy of the Ten Commandments. Again, the Ark representing God's presence, His throne. But the commandments within the ark, letting us know what kind of God are we talking about, describing his nature, describing his character. And it was here that this altar of incense was to be set. Moses told, I want you to make it 18 inches long by 18 inches wide by 36 inches high. Remember, we talked about a cubit was a foot and a half. It was to have rings. It was to have poles in order to be carried, just like the ark, as we talked about, just like the table of showbread, just like the altar of burnt offering was. 
And here's what it was used for, verse seven. And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And so the command is twice a day, morning and evening, Aaron was to burn incense on this altar. Again, it's set just outside the Holy of Holies when he would go in to take care of the golden lampstand that we talked about. This lampstand that was to burn 24-7, he was to burn this incense as well. And what's significant about this is that the burning of incense was a picture of prayer. The whole idea, as, as the smoke rose from this burning heavenward, it was a picture of the prayers of God's people rising before his throne. And we see this connection clearly in the scripture. In, in Revelation, we have this heavenly scene just before the Lord opens the seventh seal. And this is what John records. This is Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. That's the altar of incense. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. This clear picture is the incense rising, the prayers of God's people rising before his throne. The fact that, that God correlates our prayers not just to any burning, but specifically the burning of incense, it really shows us God's heart toward our prayers. Because incense has a, has a sweet smell to it. And it speaks of the reality that not only can we now offer prayer to the Lord as a result of what took place on that mercy seat, but even more, what's offered is a sweet smell. It's a pleasurable offering to the Lord. It's not just that we can pray, as amazing as that is, but that God actually delights in your and my prayers. He loves our prayers. They aren't a burden to him. They aren't received as nagging or an inconvenience or a duty he has to hear. God's not looking at his watch, wondering, when is this going to be over? When, when is this person going to shut it? When is somebody else going to come in and interrupt me? When's it going to be lunchtime so I can get away from this? No, we see here our prayers are like a wonderful aroma that makes God want to stop and breathe it in. If you're going to enjoy the moment. Because prayer shows we're depending on him. Right? Prayer shows we're acknowledging the Lord. Prayer shows we're valuing him. It's just like an earthly parent. As a parent, you love it when your kids come to you and seek your advice and acknowledge they need your help. Now, maybe when they're little, you're kind of like, you know, can I have five minutes? But especially as they get older and they're still coming to you, seeking these things, you aren't put off by that. You're honored that they would recognize the value of what you have to offer. And that's how it is with our Heavenly Father. And I submit all this to us because it's so important that we have this mindset that prayer is as incense before the Lord. Because... I know you've figured this out by now. There are often delays in our prayers. God doesn't always answer prayer right away. Maybe you're more spiritual than I am and, and it works better for you. But in my life, there are many delays. And there's a huge temptation that comes when there's a delay when we pray. That is, we often begin to think, well, this must mean God doesn't care. Well, there's this delay. He's not answering. It must mean God's not interested in what I'm, what I'm asking, what I'm seeking. It must be my prayers aren't important to him. They don't matter to him. But the fact that God used sweet smelling incense to symbolize the prayers of his people shows us that thinking couldn't be further from the truth. God's delays have nothing to do with his lack of care and concern and desire to work in our lives. Rather, his delays are often more to do with his perfect timing. You remember Luke chapter one, Zacharias is a priest in the temple. He's having the privilege to burn incense before this very altar we're, we're reading here. And remember, the angel Gabriel appears to Zacharias in that moment. It says, Zacharias, I know your wife has been barren all her life. And now she's old, no children. But I'm here to tell you that God is going to give you a son. But not just any son, Zacharias, you're going to have John the Baptist 
the child who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, no doubt, Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth had spent years praying and asking for a child. And yet, year after year, she never got pregnant. The answer was continually no. And it would have seemed that God didn't care. It would have seemed their prayers weren't pleasing to him. But we know that wasn't the case at all. God was simply waiting for the right time. He was waiting to answer their prayer in an even greater way than they desired. They no doubt, they just wanted a kid. We just want a child. But God wanted to give them not just a child, but the very child who would have the privilege of pointing the nation to Jesus. And so the Lord met John at the altar of incense to make clear not just the prayers of a nation for a Messiah, but the prayers of a father for a child had been heard, had been received by heaven because the prayers of God's people are as sweet incense to him. Notice verse nine. And you shall not offer strange incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. Notice this, God was very selective in the incense that should be used. It wasn't just any incense that they decided they wanted to burn. And we're going to see God go give the specifics in, in just a moment. But this points to the reality that our prayer can only be offered a certain way. Now, I, I don't mean there, there's only one way to pray. As in, you know, you have to fold your hands and bow your head and close your eyes. Or you have to be on your knees. Or That's not what we're talking about. But there is only a certain type of prayer that's accepted before God. And of course, we know that prayer is through Jesus. He's the reason and the only reason we can approach the throne of God and be heard by him. And in many ways, you can say, Jesus, he's our incense. He's what makes our prayers and intercessions a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And on top of this, the Lord makes clear to, to Moses that not only are they to use a certain type of incense, but this altar wasn't to be used for any other type of offering or atonement. You weren't to use it for a burnt offering or a grain offering or, or a drink offering. This wasn't an altar to make atonement on. This was the place where the results of atonement were to be lived out. That is, we don't save ourselves by prayer. Prayer is where we live out. Prayer is where we get to apply and access the salvation that's already been accomplished for us. We see more of this in what God commands next. Verse 10, And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it. Throughout your generations it is most holy to the Lord. And so Moses told once a year, you are to have Aaron the high priest take the blood from the sin offering and go and anoint the incense altar. Take that sacrifice on the bronze altar out in the courtyard. Take some of that blood, come bring it into the tabernacle and apply it to the horns of this altar. Now remember in the scripture, horns speak of strength. Again, the idea being the strength of the prayers. The, the effectiveness of the prayers was because of the blood of the sacrifice for sin. Again, atonement was made at the bronze altar. Again, bronze speaking of, of judgment. The animal judged for the sins of the people. It was simply remembered at the incense altar. And again, for you and I, we recognize this is what makes the, our prayers effective. This is what allows our prayers to make it to the throne of heaven. It's the reason, the only reason God can receive our prayers is because of the blood of Jesus that pays for our sin. It alone allows God to hear your and my intercessions. And so that's the altar of incense. But within these three pieces of furniture in the tabernacle, in the holy place, as we consider the table of showbread, the incense altar, and the lampstand, Again, there's this incredible picture as we put this together of what the blood of Jesus provides for us, for, for what happens at that mercy seat, what it opens for you and I. First of all, we see the participation we've been given with the Lord in the table of showbread, the fellowship we can now have with God. We see the revelation we can now receive through the atonement in the golden lampstand, in the menorah, as the Lord lights our way, reveals himself to us, and then we see the intercession that can now be made by you and I before the throne of God through the altar of incense. And again, all of this because of that blood that's applied by our Lord at the mercy seat before the throne of God. Verse 11, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. Now, the Lord's instructions kind of seem a little strange here. He jumps from one of the furnishings of the tabernacle and then he'll come back to another furnishing. But in between, now he's talking about ransoms and, and censuses. And it's kind of seemed kind of strange. But actually, it's not strange. For one, there's, there's a great spiritual truth here. And secondly, as we'll see, this is going to be the way in which the Lord is going to allow the ministry of the tabernacle to, to be able to take place and continue. Now, of course, we know a census involves numbering people, counting people. For instance, it was used by kings in Israel before they would go to, to battle to determine the number of fighting men who were available. So that a census signified ownership. Who, who belongs to me? Those who belong to me, I can count them. Well, when it came to Israel, who owned the Israelites? Who do they belong to? Well, of course, they belonged to the Lord. And the reason they belonged wasn't because, you know, God kidnapped them, but because God bought them. Right? He ransomed them from slavery. He delivered them. He saved them. So ultimately, he alone could count and to drive home who they really belong to, God said, if there's ever a need for a census, you are to give a ransom. We'll see what that was in a moment. You're to pay a, a half shekel of silver to me, God will say. Pay it ultimately to the tabernacle as an acknowledgement. These people don't ultimately belong to you, some man, some king, but they ultimately belong to me. Which really helps explain David's issue, remember, in 2 Samuel 24. When David decides he's going to number the men of Israel, right? And Joab runs to him and, and, and says, no, you can't do this, king. What are you doing? Don't do this. And, and remember, David just says, no, no, I want you to number them. And you remember the story as a result, God sent a plague upon the nation. The issue seems to be what we're reading up here. David didn't obey God. He didn't pay the ransom. He didn't acknowledge that ultimately these people belonged to the Lord. And God continues, verse 13, this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. Here's the, here's the price, as we said, a half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras. That helps us, doesn't it? The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. It's kind of an aside. You know, we talk sometimes about the age of accountability, and, and I, don't, I don't know what that age is, but I think it's interesting to consider that 20 is the age God set for what constituted an adult for census purposes. Something to consider when it comes to determining what is exactly the age of accountability. Verse 15 says, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And notice in this ransom, God was very clear to declare every person was to be ransomed with the same price. Rich or poor, the payment was the same. The reason being because everyone's equal before God. You aren't more valuable if you have more money. You aren't less valuable if you have less money. We're all equal. And therefore, all redeemed by the same price. And of course, we know ultimately not redeemed by silver, but as Peter tells us, by a much greater price, the very precious blood of Jesus. And again, verse 16 makes clear, God would use this, this giving, this ransom, as the, in a very practical way to allow the function of the tabernacle, the services of the tabernacle to be carried on in the years to come. Verse 17, he returns now to the last piece of furniture. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. And so now this again, final piece of, of furniture in the tabernacle, the bronze laver, which so we go back outside into the court of the tabernacle to see this. Located there between the bronze altar and the tabernacle structure. 
Essentially, it was a large reservoir of water, the place that Moses is told the priests are to wash their hands, wash their feet before they carry out their services to the Lord, before they offer their, their sacrifices. Again, driving home the need for the priest to be cleansed. Now, that can seem kind of redundant because if you remember last time in, in chapter 29, that as a part of the priest consecration ceremony, the first thing they were to do was to go and stand at the doorway of the tabernacle and be washed with water to have what would essentially be a full body washing. Again, spoke of the fact they'd been cleansed before the Lord. But, and then God could clothe them, then God could anoint them, as we saw. At that moment, they were clean in God's sight. But now here's the Lord commanding another washing. What, what's the Lord communicating? He's communicating that though they were clean in his sight, the labor showed they still needed to have their hands and their feet Washed. That is, they still needed a daily cleansing from living in a fallen, dirty world. And of course, it's a picture for you and I in our lives as, as, as priests under the Lord now. We've been washed clean when we were born again. This is a once and for all reality. Now in God's eyes, we are clean, we are pure, we are holy in his sight. But we still walk in a polluted world, don't we? We still work in a fallen environment. We still have to deal with our own sinful flesh. So we need our hands. We need our feet clean. And the primary way the Bible tells us that you and I wash our hands and wash our feet is by God's word. You remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, verse 27, speaking of Jesus, he says that he might sanctify and cleanse her, that is, the church, by the washing of water by the word. It's amazing what happens, and I know you all experience it every day. When you open up the scripture and you begin to, to read it's as if you're, you're dipping your mind. It's as if you're dipping your heart in, in the labor. In all the junk from living in a fallen world and working in a worldly environment that gets attached to our minds and gets attached to our, our lives, it just gets washed clean. And there's a freshness and there's a, there's a renewing. And now we're ready to step into a, to another day, rightly to serve the Lord, rightly to represent him. And we live through that day and we realize, oh, I need another cleansing. And we go back to God's word and we get that refreshment over and over again. You remember Jesus with, with Peter in the, in the upper room on the night of, of his arrest. Remember Jesus is going around the, the table, watch his disciples' feet, Peter, right? no, no, you're not, you're not doing this to me, Lord. And Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. Of course, then Peter goes to the other end of the extreme, okay, then wash all of me, not from head to toe. And Jesus says, Peter, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Of course, speaking of, of Judas. But Jesus is making clear, our salvation, it's a one-time thing. You, you don't need to get saved over and over again, but we do need cleansing from living in these fallen bodies, in this fallen world, to be in right relationship, right fellowship with our Lord, to be priest unto the Lord, to serve and that's what the Lord is speaking to his people here. Well, verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourselves quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil, and you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And so now the Lord kind of backs up and gives Moses specific instructions concerning the oil that he's already told him were to be used in anointing the priest and anointing the furnishings in the tabernacle. Remember, as we talked about, oil represents the Holy Spirit. And we see here this oil that was to be used was to be made with certain spices. Specifically, Moses is told, sweet-smelling spices. That is, there was to be an aroma connected with those things that were anointed with the oil. And isn't that how our lives should be? For those who walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's to be an aroma associated with our lives. And let me add a sweet-smelling aroma. Paul speaks of us in the New Testament of being an aroma of Christ. 
He says to those who are being saved, it's an aroma of life. To those who are perishing, it's an aroma of death. But either way, it's clear there's something different about us. And if we're walking in the Spirit, there should be an outward evidence to those around us. Just as there were to those priests who were anointed with this oil. Verse 26, And with it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, with all of its utensils and the labor in its base. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priest. And you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be, notice, poured on man's flesh. Nor shall you make any other like it. According to its composition, it is holy. And it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. And notice, God tells Moses to be very, very specific. Not only in the use of this, but also in how it's used. First of all, he says there in verse 32, it wasn't to be poured out on man's flesh. That is, it wasn't something you could just say, hey, you know, I want to grab a bottle of that. You know, I've got, I've got a date this weekend. This would make great aftershave. So can I, can I just use this? God says, no. This was not to be used to enhance one's flesh, but to glorify God. And what a picture that is of how it is to be with the Holy Spirit. Right? The Spirit's not given to you and I to enhance our desires. The Spirit's not given to us to exalt our flesh. The Spirit's poured out upon us to point people to the Lord. That the attention wouldn't be on us, it would be upon Him. You remember in Acts, when, when Simon the sorcerer saw through the laying on of hands that the Spirit came upon believers. And so remember, he pulled out his wallet, and he went up to Peter, and he says, Hey, can, can I buy some of this power? So when I lay hands on people, that they'll, they'll be filled with the Spirit as well. And remember, Peter had some pretty strong words for Simon because he wanted to use the Spirit for his own purposes. He wanted to pour it out on his flesh. The Spirit's not given to enhance my flesh. The Spirit's given to exalt Jesus, to point to his holiness, to point to his uniqueness. And we also see in verse 32, the oil wasn't to be copied. He says, nor shall you make any other like it. This, it wasn't to be imitated. You want to try to figure out, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make my own at home. I'm going to concoct this and figure it out. Again, what a truth for our lives. We are never to try and imitate the Holy Spirit. And yet, sadly, what do we see happen often in so many places, in so many churches today? People trying to drum up the Spirit, right? with hype, with emotion, trying to, to create a work of the Spirit by, by doing certain things. Yes, I believe the work of the Spirit's real. Yes, I believe we're desperately in need of the work of the Spirit. But the Spirit's not a force to be manipulated. The Spirit is a person who's to be submitted to. No need to try to copy him. No try, need to try to, to drum him up and make him happen. Our job is simply to submit to him, humble ourselves, and let him do his work. Well, not only were there instructions to make the oil, but, but God even gives Moses instructions to make the incense. Verse 34, And the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stacked in ancha and galbanum, please do not quote me, and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves. According to its composition, it shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. And again, as we mentioned earlier, the Lord is very specific and how the incense was, was to be made. Only certain spices could be used. Again, this picture of the fact that there's only a certain type of prayer that's received by the Lord. Again, prayer that's offered through Jesus. 
I might say, well, I can, I can pray to God in different ways. I can go through different means. I can go through Buddha or, or Islam or Mary. And God was making very clear from the beginning, no. It's very specific how you get heard before me. It's through my son. You also couldn't decide, well, you know what? I like this spice. I like this smell. And, and you know, I, I've got a lot of company coming over for the holidays, and so I was thinking maybe I could make some for my house, right? And we could, we could burn it while everybody was over eating, eating Christmas cookies, right, and, and, and drinking hot chocolate. And God is very clear to say, no, whoever does this, whoever compounds any like it, whoever, whoever tries to, to, to bring it in, into their home and use it for themselves will be cut off from their people. Strong language. But again, it's a reminder for us, we aren't to take the things of God and seek to use them for the purposes of man. And even as it relates to our prayers, our prayers aren't ultimately for us. Our prayers aren't ultimately simply to get what we want, to get God to to follow our agenda. Our prayers are ultimately for the Lord, to seek what he wants, what his desires are for our lives. Chapter 31, and we can do this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, see, I've called by the name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, and I put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that's on it, all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table, its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the labor in its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, the garments of his sons to minister as priest and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do." Now, maybe you're a person that can handle a lot, but I put myself in Moses' place, and I imagine Moses had to have felt pretty overwhelmed as God was telling him, I want this built, I want that built, and you've got to put it together like this, and then, oh yeah, and then there's all these clothes you've got to design, and you've got to use certain types of threads, and then you've got to get these jewels together, oh yeah, and then there's this incense, but you can only use certain spices, and oh yeah, I forgot about the, the oil I told you you've got to make. I mean, you could, I would just be totally overwhelmed, right? thinking, I've got to do all this, right? I just hear Moses saying, I'm, I'm just a shepherd, God. Right? You call me to talk. I told you I can't even talk. And there's no way I can do all this. And I love this because notice what the Lord does for, for Moses after laying all these instructions upon him. And no doubt Moses feeling the weight of all this, letting Moses know that the things that he's commanded him to do, he would equip him to do. In this case, that equipping would come from these men that God would provide, who he would equip to do the work. God makes clear, I've gifted, I've I've filled with my spirit these men, Bezalel and Aholiab, with the skills, the wisdom, the understanding of all these things, Moses. They're going to carry these things out. Which, and this is a great lesson for you and I when it comes to God's call for us to do something. And that is God will always provide what's needed. God will always equip when it comes to his command, whether that's gifting us or whether, as we see in this case, from others he brings alongside us. Moses was called to lead the children of Israel, but it didn't mean Moses had to do it all. It didn't mean other people weren't important. Yes, Moses and Aaron had a specific role in calling, but the work of these other men was just as spiritual, and they were just as called, and they were just as as gifted. And the New Testament tells us the same thing, doesn't it? For the work of the Lord to be be accomplished, we need the entire body of Christ. Paul writes of this. How ridiculous it is, right, for the hand to say you don't need the foot and for the eye to say you don't need, need the mouth. We need the gifts that the Spirit has given to each person. And then we, in turn, need to be willing to use those gifts in whatever way God has called us to obey Him in. Aaron's role as high priest was important, vitally important. Aaron got a role that no other man in Israel, until he died, received. Aaron got to go in to the Holy of Holies. 
He got to go before the ark. Essentially, he got to go before the throne of God and bring that, that blood sacrifice that would make atonement for the nation. High, high privilege. But recognize, all of that would have meant nothing if Bezalel and Aholiab hadn't been faithful to use their gifts to build and to saw and to cut and to mix. Without that, there wouldn't have been an ark. There wouldn't have been a mercy seat for Aaron to offer that blood of atonement upon. We're all needed in the body of Christ. Every gift is valuable. Verse 12, God's final instructions now. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbath you shall keep. For it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Notice as the Lord finishes up his instructions to Moses there on the mountain, he takes Moses back to a subject he's already covered, the Sabbath, which that really stands out. The final instruction, the last thing he's going to say, that he takes Moses back to something he already talked about. As we, we, we read about the Sabbath and talked about this back in chapter 23. And remember, just, just briefly, we talked about that the Sabbath was a day of rest. Right? Israel was to refrain from work. God reiterates it here. He worked six days. The seventh day was to be a day set apart to the Lord. And by living this way, God says, it'll be a reflection to those around you that the Lord is your God. You're going to be a representation of me as you do this because I am the Lord. I'm the one who worked, created the world in six days, and then rested on the seventh day. And again, rested not because God was tired, not because he was worn out, but because he was done. Everything was complete. Everything was good. Everything was provided for. And thus, God says, this will be a sign. This is going to be the outward evidence of the covenant, the outward proof that you're in a relationship with me, the Lord, a distinct God from all these other gods. As you live this way, it's a reflection of me as the creator God. To Noah, God gave the sign of his covenant was a rainbow. To Abraham, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. To the children of Israel and Moses, the sign of this covenant would be the Sabbath. But again, why did God reiterate it here? God's already went over this once. Why does he drive it home one more time? Well, I submit to us maybe for a couple reasons. They kind of go together. One possibly was to reiterate that though there was a lot to do in preparing the tabernacle, there was a lot that had to be built, there was a lot that had to be made, God was possibly trying to drive home, Moses, in the midst of this, I want you to continue to honor the Sabbath. Because there would have been a huge temptation, would there not, to think, man, we have all this work that needs to be done. And to think, we got to work 24-7 to get all this in place. And God was, was making clear, make sure. Yes, I want you to obey me, but make sure you don't disobey my Sabbath command to keep these other instructions. Don't disobey me in this area to obey me in that area. But there may have also been even bigger truth God was reiterating. And that is, after calling them to do all this work, not, not just building all this and getting it together, but all that was going to come from then forward. I mean, years. There were going to be of offering sacrifices and, and making offerings and paying ransoms and washings and anointings and services. All of this, lighting, lighting candles, burning incense. All of this was going to be going on and on and on, which, by the way, was all important. Again, we're not to think God was just giving busy work, right? Just to keep, keep his kids out of trouble, just give them something to do. No, this, God was working through these things. They were teaching important truth. But very possibly, God was making clear that in the midst of all these things I've called you to do, and they're all important, and I'm going to hold you accountable to them, I want you to remember to rest in me. Almost like a final reminder, yes, I've called you to do these things, but you aren't doing these things to earn anything. That's not why I'm asking you to do these things. 
I'm calling you to do them out of what I've already done for you. I've done the work. I've redeemed you. I've saved you. I've delivered you. I set you free. It was like the Lord was reiterating the importance of honoring the Sabbath day so that his people would remember this truth and rest in him, trust in him, and not trust in all of these works. Now, as we've talked about, the Sabbath was ultimately fulfilled, we know, in Jesus. Hebrews tells us he's our Sabbath rest. We now rest in his finished work on the cross to make us right with God, to allow us to, to dwell with God. So that for you and I, dishonoring the Sabbath now in Jesus really has nothing to do with what day you work on or don't work on or what day you, you worship on or, or, or don't worship on. Now, dishonoring the Sabbath, now that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, you could say, is when we seek to earn God's love. That's dishonoring the Sabbath. When we seek to earn his favor, I think we have to do in order to be accepted by him. We're honoring the one who fulfilled our Sabbath rest. You know, it may seem harsh. You know, God, God says it twice there. In verse 14, he, he tells them, everyone who profanes the Sabbath shall be put to death. And then in verse 15, he says it again, whoever does any work on the Sabbath will be put to death. You're like, man, God, you're harsh. People do a little work on a certain day and you're going to put them to death? I mean, that's not like committing adultery or immorality or murder or some of these other things we, we read. But it actually wasn't a harsh truth at all. God was trying to teach a very, very important eternal truth because essentially eternity was hanging in the balance based on what the Sabbath law was speaking. And that is trying to earn your way to God, work your way to God rather than resting in the finished work of Jesus will lead to death. A death much worse than any physical death. It'll lead to eternal death. It'll lead to eternal separation from God because we can't do it. We can't be good enough. The law was never about earning salvation. The tabernacle was never about earning salvation. It was all about pointing people to the sacrifice of Jesus that alone provides salvation and resting in that. And then the last verse of chapter 31 we read, and when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he, the Lord, gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Notice this, no ink was needed. Most didn't have to call back down the mountain. You know, Joshua, are you still down there? Did you have to bring a pen up here? I need to write these things down. No, these things were written with God's finger in stone, we're told. And the fact that they're in stone, of course, points to their permanence. God wouldn't change. His standards wouldn't change. Because, again, the problem was never God's when it came to the law. The problem was never God's when it came to the tabernacle. It was perfect. It was right. It was, the problem was always the sinful heart of man. And that's why God would send Jesus. Because all of this, it could deal with the outward, but it couldn't deal with the inward. And so God sent Jesus and dwelling in, in a man, the God-man, so that the heart of man could be changed. So that God can now write his law, not on tablets of stone, but now God can write his law on hearts of flesh on our human heart, that now by the sacrifice of Jesus in the empty tomb and faith in his finished work, we can be born again by the Spirit of God and God's Spirit comes to live inside of us and now we actually have the power. Now we actually have the ability to live out God's standards. Now we have the power to actually follow his law. Again, not to earn anything, but simply because he's given us everything. And so all that the Lord gave to Israel in the law, in the tabernacle, again, pointing to Jesus, draw, drawing them to understand that he's the law and he's the provision to meet the law. It's all in him. And God gave this to Israel to point them to this. And the beautiful thing for you and I today is that whereas they just had the substance or the shadow pointing to the substance, you and I now, we have the substance. 
we have the fullness of everything God was pointing to. We can now know this Jesus. And we can now experience everything that the, that the tabernacle was looking forward to. We have an access that is great as Moses, as great as Aaron, and their experience was we have something so much greater. We get to walk in the fulfillment of all this again, not because of us, but in spite of us, but because of our Jesus. And so tonight, let's just close just thanking him for what he's provided for us, what he's fulfilled for us. And let's make sure that we're taking advantage of it every day. Father, we do love you and we thank you, God. And we thank you for these types. We thank you for these pictures, Lord. But um, if we just got stuck on them, we would miss it. The point is you fulfilled all this in Jesus. And so he's the one we want to make sure we're holding tight to. He's the one we want to make sure we're drawing into and celebrating and worshiping and honoring, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the privilege um, to taste these things that the prophets longed to look into, that Moses and Aaron longed to look into, Lord, things that they didn't understand as they were obeying you, Lord. We get that privilege of now walking in this intimacy with you, knowing the the dwelling place of God, that, that we don't have to go now into a, to a building, Lord, but you say now we're your tabernacle, we're your temple, and you live inside of us, Lord. Lord, you can write your, your word not on tablets of stone, but now you can write your word on our heart, and we can know you and walk with you intimately. What an incredible privilege, what an incredible honor, and again, all because of what you've done for us in spite of us, Lord. So we just want to say thank you, and Lord, we want to live this week enjoying our privilege, Lord. Lord, we want to take advantage of the opportunity to come before you, Lord, and seek you, knowing that our prayers rise to you as incense, that you receive us, God. And I just pray for those right now who, who've been praying tonight um, and, and for a long time about issues in their life. And God, they haven't heard from you yet. Lord, would you encourage your people tonight, those who are waiting, those who are in the midst of that delay, let them know, God, that you are not angry with them. God, let them know you haven't forgotten them. Lord, remind them tonight that those prayers are a sweet incense. Lord, you receive those. You savor those, Lord. Every time your kids come and pour their heart out to you, and in the right time, and in a way far beyond anything we could ask or imagine, Lord, you're going to answer, and you're going to do so much more for us, Lord, than we ever thought possible. It may not be exactly like we want, but, Lord, it'll be exactly as we need, and it will be a beautiful, glorious thing. So, Lord, encourage us in that tonight as well. And so we love you, and we thank you, and we just go out praising you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.